IVT's Computer Systems Validation and Software Assurance Week is back and better than ever. The acclaimed source for delivering regulatory updates, evaluating novel system integration methodologies, and discovering the latest in digital innovations, CSV Week 2021 delivers a three-day virtual conference experience. Backed by two decades of industry insights and educational training, this is the most recognized event for CSV professionals to navigate the digital transformation, realize excellence in next generation approaches to quality systems, share lessons from the field and strategize on industry best practices. Hear from top pharma and biotech executives, gain exclusive insights from FDA speakers and be part of the CSA and digital transformation discussions while leveraging unlimited network opportunities with colleagues and key decision makers. Plus, our all new digital badging and GMP credit system is now available. You won't want to miss it. For all the information, visit www.informaconnect.com backslash CSV. For all details on agenda, registration, and special group rates for teachers. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you, and welcome to another episode of Voices in Validation, brought to you by the IVT Network. This week, we're going to talk about eliminating human error. And of course, to err is human, but is human error a justified cause in GMP investigations? In pharmaceutical manufacturing, upwards of 80% of process deviations can be attributed to human error. While regulatory agencies make clear that all deviations, including those caused by human error, must be fully investigated, can we say that we are effectively doing that as an industry? Here to provide some insight into the identification and reduction of human error in GMP facilities is Dr. Jeanette Colazzo, CEO of Human Error Solutions. Welcome, Jeanette. It's great to have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Such, a, uh, such an interesting topic and obviously not a new one, but one that we're still grappling with as an industry. So um, as we start today, can you kick us off by defining human error in this context? What exactly are we referring to? Yeah, it's interesting that, that um, you're asking me to define it in this context because that's very important, the context. Um, you know, we, we make mistakes in our lives. We have um, situations that are personal, but when we're talking about an organizational environment, it is a controlled environment and we can control certain variables that we wouldn't be able to do it, you know, in, in our necessarily in our personal life. It's not like I have a procedure to work with things in my house, you know, it's not, it's not the same right. thing. So the context is very important, especially because we're also talking about the regulations and the expectations of regulatory agencies around the world. So, right. so there are certain expectations that apply to our industry. So in terms of the definition, well, we have different definitions, okay? We have um, one that it's kind of universal, which is um, any action or lack of action that results in something different than expected, right? I did something and I, my, my, my result is different than I expect. So if you go back and you try to identify what, what, you know, what was the causal factor, then you might find a human action or a lack of action. Now, there is another very interesting definition, which is any action or lack of action that exceeds the system tolerance. And that doesn't mean that there was an impact, but the, the result could be the same one, but the fact that there is an action or a lack of action that exceeded the system tolerance tells you that there is a deviation that still needs to be investigated, even if you come out with the same um, conclusion which is no impact to the batch or you know right we can release it but still you have to you have to investigate it so it so in this case what we're saying is that people um deviate from the expectations meaning you know i have a lower and and um and higher limits and um i need to mix for four minutes but i mix for three and a half so that will be exceeding the the tolerance on the lower sure. side so, so those are the two definitions that we have. We still have to investigate them both, but my experience is that most 
of the um, investigations that we do are or fall into the second category. Sure, and that makes sense. So we noted um, that 80% of deviations in the GMP facility are um, due to, at least in part, uh, human error. So why such a high number? 80%, well, because, like, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very large number. Yes, because um, technology has advanced a lot. So the variability in the process has been kind of um, managed. So maybe it's not that there, is, there are more mistakes, but when you compare them in terms of percentages, then the, the human error, which is one of the things that we have not worked with, you know, human factors, then it's going to be more visible because I'm reducing um, all technical. the other points of error. Right. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So you mentioned regulatory agencies. Are, are they clear that the agencies themselves in their guidance on human error uh, deviations? And can you review kind of current guidelines uh, on that particular subject? Yes. Um, uh, it's, it's, I have worked with the FDA and um, it's interesting that sometimes it's difficult for people to understand what all of this is about, even them. So, right. um, so in terms of regulators, let's talk about the FDA. In, in, um, I mean, GMPs are GMPs. It doesn't matter if we're talking about 211, 210. You know, at the end of the day, they all have the same expectations and they have the, sure. old, you know, the same spirit behind it. But uh, as an example, I'm going to use 211.22, where it says um, that where human error is suspected or identified um, as a cause, this needs to be fully investigated. The, um, the exact wording is uh, the, that the quality control unit has the responsibility and the authority to review production records to assure that no errors have occurred or if errors have occurred that they have been fully investigated. They being, being the key word in that sentence. When they say they, they're talking about the error. And then they right. say, I want you to fully investigate it. So basically what they're saying is, I want you to find the root cause of the error. So human error is not a root cause and has been written like that in the regulation forever. Right. So, um, so on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, it's very interesting. I wanna, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting. No, that's okay. I, yeah, it, in Europe, the European GMP, it's a little bit more specific. And this was a revision that it's not that um, that old. It's more, it's, it's more current. And sure. what they put in that revision, it's, it's basically that whenever human error or, you know, human error is suspected or identified as the cause, meaning causal factor, mm -hmm. this should be justified. Haven't taken care to ensure that process, procedural, or system-based errors or problems have not been overlooked if present. Then they expect appropriate actions, um, you know, corrective actions and preventive actions. And the way to, to do that, and they actually continue to say, they want a system that you can monitor and assess by effectiveness, all based on risk. So they're a little bit more specific on what they expect. They expect you to take a look at your process, at your procedures, at your systems, and make sure that there are no gaps there that are causing people to make mistakes. So that's another thing. And that's why we are so much in need for a very specific process to do human error investigations, because that's where investigations begin again. You know, right. it's, Right. Also factor, and now you have to start again. So it sounds like um, that the regulatory agencies are very clear about their expectations around investigating any deviations, um, especially or even including human error. Um, and the whole gist of their guidance is to find the root cause and solve the problem. Um, so regulatory agencies then obviously are, they have their set of expectations, including those that um, are around human error, but our CAPAs or corrective and preventative actions fail to identify often um, the reasons for those failures. You know, I, I, I love that you mentioned uh, human error is not a root cause, yet so many of, um, of our responses lists human error as the cause and they don't really investigate any further. Where is the disconnect here in your expert opinion? Um, yes, um, it's kind of the missing link 
in our in our investigation process. Yeah. Um, why do I think that happens? Because the expertise in our organizations, especially GMP um, industries, the expertise that we have is more technical. We don't really have people that are able to explain human behavior. We do. Um, in, we do have. Um, experts that you know if we have an equipment failure we have experts that can explain that can explain equipment behavior we have experts that can explain the product behavior the process behavior but when it comes to human behavior which is the most complex equipment in existence yeah. we don't really have experts that can explain why did i forget it's you know if i ask you why you forget then the, the obvious answer is because the, it was a memory failure now in the context of an organization, why is there activities that are risky, you know, that, that, that are critical, that do not control that possibility of happening? Why don't I have an alarm, um, a checklist, or something that is going to remind me to do things? Because I cannot change human condition, but I can change the conditions in which humans work. So if I don't want you to forget something, and I understand that human limitations include memory, especially these last 10 years, we have lost basically 50% of our memory capacity due to our gadgets and our electronic systems. We have delegated our memory. And this new generation, you know, does not need the, the, the memory as much as some generations needed before. We used to, you know, memorize our phone numbers and so on. So there is not a lot of activity associated to memory. So the expectation that people will um, will not forget to do certain things is an unrealistic expectation. It's our job in our in the organization to design to put barriers of defense or detection mechanisms to um, to identify when it happens so we can correct and recover. Of course. And so in, in the example that you just gave, forgetting to uh, do a task or follow up on something, obviously that would um, whether or not you have your little prompts, that you know definitely can be attributed to a human action, um, but I'm curious. Eighty percent of deviations are human error. So are human errors always a human's fault? Um, in no. other words, is it typically a performance issue, or are there other reasons that we would classify something as human error? Well, um, again, if we're talking about a controlled environment environment like the organization, then you would be able to say it's not the human's fault unless, and, and, and there are, of course, exceptions, unless, um, for example, my job is to identify um, defects and, uh, or, or, you know, in my visual inspection to identify foreign matter. Um, it could, it could require that I see colors, you know, it, 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 it could. So right. um, it would be my fault if I have that problem, if you remove me and you remove the problem and whomever, whomever is coming after me does not have the same likelihood of making the mistake, then it's the human. You can remove the human. But that's not the real case. Actually, if that was the case, you would always go back to administrative systems because then you should have tested me for color detection. Yeah. And it would be a lot easier to remediate the, the situation if, if it was something simple that you can identify, right, with a particular human. So... Yeah. That makes sense. And there are um, other, um, there is another um, element to consider is violations. Violations is when I do something that I'm not supposed to be doing, but I do it uh, either because I, I, I am in a hurry or there is always a reason yeah. for that, that we can control. Sure. sure. And if I, but but uh, violation would be um, appropriate if we can demonstrate that the person understood the consequences or is a repeated event right right otherwise yeah. it's our job to to work with 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 um everything else which is good good news because that means that the organization has to control yes absolutely absolutely uh, and so recognizing that humans don't operate in a vacuum um what can we do? Because you've mentioned that there are things as an organization we can do. So what can, can you talk about some of them ways that we as the organization uh, can reduce human error? Um, what can we do? What should we be doing? Yeah, we first of all, we have to learn what human error means and how it looks like, because that will give us the information to identify um, not only the root cause when we are doing an investigation, but 
to prevent by understanding human limitations and putting barriers of defense. But I need to understand how that looks like. And that's not necessarily something that we um, get in the organization for the for the same reasons that I was talking about, you know, the the um, industrial engineer, the mechanical engineer, the chemical engineer, but we don't really have a human engineer. And that's precisely the missing link. That's where the education is so important because you need to learn what causes mistakes so you can design errors out. Um, and that's the, 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 the main um, uh, importance here. Absolutely. And that leads me directly into my follow-up question for you. Um, which is about systems and processes. Um, what, which of the, which systems and processes are critical to achieving goals of reduction and eventually, hopefully, elimination of human errors? So, if you can talk about that, that would be um, very uh, helpful to our listeners. Yeah, one of the most important um, things that we have to consider is the validation, precisely. Um, if we talk about um, the definition of validation is to submit the process to the worst case scenario or to challenge the process so it demonstrates that it can be um, repeatable, that it will have consistent results. But the problem is that in terms of humans, um, validation exercises are far from being the worst case scenario. We do it with the best operator, the best mechanic. Um, we isolate the area with a jello tape, like it's a crime scene. There is a sign that says, um, you know, silence validation in process. The engineers are right there to help and assist the operator, which are subject matter experts in any type of decision. So when you finish your validation exercise and you remove all of this and now you say here manufacturing now you have to manufacture and you have to increase OE you have to reduce cycle time you have to um, avoid all of this so so basically they give you a process that still needs improvement while still we're doing com commercial batches so it sounds like while they're going through validation, they're actually creating an environment that isn't necessarily typical to the environment that um, any of their team is going to be working in. So it's already flawed yes. in its thought process. Yeah, well, it's not. It's it's just that the human factors are not considered. They're not factored in in the exercises. Right. So right. of course that's and and again it, we wouldn't think about that too much. Um, because of course our exercises are interesting, you know, we, we do have a sense of urgency. We want to make sure that, you know, they pass, but when you have to sacrifice it's part of the reality of the process, then it's going to show up later on. So yeah. sometimes, sometimes it's, if we understand people limitations and then, but, but we can do this with, um, um, tracking, um, what's happening. If you all of a sudden see that um, most of our deviations in one particular process is that people exceed the time, then probably the problem is not the people, but the time that we are expecting, because then we go back to these investigations and we see no impact to the batch, no impact to the batch, no impact to the batch. So that means that problem do is go back to the drawing board and then say, we need more, um, we need to expand our limits, even though we do want to reduce the variability, but I want to make sure that this is realistic for the human, considering all other variables like you know alarms, like like um, jams, like you know interruptions because I need a check by or approve by. So all of those things need to be part of the replica of the process while we're doing validation, and not necessarily something that we consider. Then we we identify these limitations, and then we have to go back to the drawing board. And then it's very difficult for the organization to accept that we need to revalidate something because I want people to, to not make mistakes. Yeah, right. And so we try to fix um, the, right. We try to fix the people and instead of the process sometimes, and uh, that doesn't always work out. And speaking of which, so we, we talked about regulatory agencies' expectations for investigation. Can you talk a little bit more about what an effective human error investigation looks like and, and maybe provide a couple of examples from um, your experience? Yeah, well, um, the um, human error investigation, you're going to see if it's appropriate, if the corrective action makes sense with the root cause. Um, because sometimes you have, well, uh, you know, it's human error, but I will 
revise the procedure to incorporate another instruction, as opposed to saying my instructions were incomplete. And that's the reason why they made human error, because if I needed that instruction, then, right. then, then we're talking about one of those factors, which is procedures. I need procedures to go, go away, and we need procedures to be human engineered. So, so we see it's human error, but we're going to have the, to revise the procedure. Well, then the, the problem is the procedure because your corrective action does not make sense unless you say, well, me, my root cause is that the procedure was incomplete or the situation is not covered, then my corrective action will be that. So, but if we keep saying it's human error, then we do retraining, then we do all these things, even separate people from the organization, which is pretty unfair um, in most cases. Uh, because people don't wake up in the morning saying, yay, today's the day that I'm going to make a mistake. I want to get in trouble. I want to have my coworkers to come back on the weekend to work on, 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 on things that need to be redone. So people do want to good, do a good job. If people don't want to do a good job and they have an intention to do harm, then that would be sabotage. Right. And sabotage is not an error unless you plan it and it doesn't go as expected. Right. Right. No, I, I, I totally agree. I think people, for the most part, want to do a good job, uh, want to do their job. And when these things happen, it's because they might feel rushed or they didn't have the right systems in place or some other factor that leads to the human error. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about training because you mentioned training. And I know that that is a frequent response of organizations to some sort of you know, in their kappa to some sort of deviation that's related to human error, they think retraining. So training is important. Of course, we do know that, but not all training is equal. So what are the key elements to consider in developing meaningful training or retraining programs for human error reduction? Well, most organizations have an induction process in which you um, train people when they start working with the organization, then you train them in procedures. It's a knowledge-based type of training. Then you have the skills-based training or on-the-job training, which is more skill-based um, and, and not knowledge-based. So you're combining all of these things. So um, training basically provides you with three things, which is knowledge, skills, and abilities. If your deviation is not due to a lack of knowledge, a lack of skill, or a lack of ability, then training is not going to be able to help you because that's all you get from training. And most people or most deviations are not related to a lack of knowledge, skill, or ability. I, I, I knew I had the skills, I had the ability, I just forgot, or I got confused, or I had to make a different decision due to my circumstances. So those are the things that, um, that we have to think about training. Training is kind of a, of a vaccine from mistakes. It's what we do pre-facto, right? Be right. Before, um, you know, before we release people to work independently. You know, if I already know that you have the knowledge because I already have my training effectiveness um, tools, I already measure that you have the knowledge, you have the skill, and you demonstrate it in your on-the-job qualification that you have the ability, then that shouldn't be a problem. Right? right, unless you have a, low, a learning curve, or these are things that are that, right. that have you to be new considered. Equipment, or you change your process, or you're developing new products, then perhaps training is appropriate. Yes. Uh, but it sounds like most of the time that's not going to be the right fix for, exactly. it, for the error or the deviation. Uh, yeah, and because you know, very, if I if I forgot to document, and the fact that you give me a retraining in the documentation procedure is not going to increase my memory capacity. Right. right. No, fair. That's a, that's a fair statement. And I hadn't thought of it in that way, but I think that is a very important takeaway for the listeners. Um, because yes. <laughs> if, if there's a gap in the process or the procedures uh, that allows you to forget, then the process and procedures need to be updated, right? As opposed to retraining on something that they're already that they already know they they just failed to do. Um, so so that makes total sense. So um, we've talked a lot uh, about a lot of different things um, today in terms of human error, and I I'm hoping that you can help narrow us in a little bit for the listener's sake. What are three steps that every organization can take today? Understanding that, you know, human error happens for a multitude of reasons. Um, so you're never probably going to eliminate it. But I think every organization can reduce the number of human error 
um, actions they, they see, you know, it, monthly, annually, whatever. So what are three steps that every organization can do today to put them, you know, on the right path to human error reduction? Well, the first step will be to quantify um, the current human error rate. Um, and the human error rate metric or the formula is to um, determine how many errors did we make based on our investigations divided by how many opportunities to commit them, which could be batches manufactured or, you know, um, parts per million or whatever our denominator is. I mean, the laboratories, it could be how many OOS due to analytical um, uh, analyst error divided by how many tests performed. So the first thing that you need to know is how is it that you're doing today? The lowest observable rate for human error is 0 0.001 in our environment, right? Because it's critical activities. And that's one in 10,000. So you know that um, you won't be able to get there because those numbers, which is the lowest observable rate, um, it's it's for pilots. It's, it's the right. lowest observable rate that we have seen. And there are other motivators like, you know, make sure that I don't kill all these people or kill myself. So, so there are other elements that increase my level of awareness and puts us in a very different situation. When we're talking about the organization, you need to know where you're now. So let's say that you're 0 0.047. Now you know that there is a possibility for reduction if we compare with other industries. Then once you have that, then you have to establish an investigation program that it's going to allow you to identify the root causes. This mm -hmm. investigation program needs to be uh, needs to be developed in a way very similar to what Europe is asking. Or, um, we have to have a system that we can monitor and assess how is it that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we do have to have a structured human error investigation program that provides us with the information to do a new root cause analysis for human error. It's very similar to equipment. If I have an equipment failure, I would not be able, and we would not be able uh, or get approved to close an investigation with just a statement saying it was equipment failure. We would need to identify what happened with the equipment. The same thing applies to human errors. So that means that we need an investigation program with predefined root causes that will allow us to um, think systematically and, and, and identify the root cause. That will be the second one. And then you would have to have, um, your um, metrics or your um, your numbers associated to what's happening by category. So that's why you have to have a, 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 a you know, a, let's say a procedure for human error investigation. We have different categories is, um, in our in our model. For example, we started with the first why is the causal factor, which is human error because human error is not a root cause. So the causal factor becomes the first step, which is my first why. Then we have a problem type. Problem type is either systems or people. Either I made a mistake because of a system problem or um, it's associated to a human action. Um, an example of a system problem is that I was following an obsolete version of the procedure. Why is it that we have obsolete versions of the procedure available for its use? So I have to go yeah, back to the documentation. <laughs> so I have to go back to my documentation and configurations control and identify systematically what's happening there. Then we have um, procedures, human factors engineering, communication, um, um, supervision, and then last but not least, individual performance. So once you have identified the number of categories, now you can continue to see how is it that the error is traveling. So then after the um, um, category, then we have the near root causes. For example, um, under the procedures category, category, I have three near root causes. One of them is that the procedure was not used. The second one is that the procedure is misleading or confusing. And the third one is that it's wrong or incomplete. If you don't find a, a, a situation there, it's not the procedure. Okay. So then you have to go back and see what's happening. Now, you are going to be able to identify the near root cause, which is defined as what happened, but not why it happened. So once I know that people were not using the procedures, I need to know why is it that people are not using the procedures. So then you have the fifth 
step, which is identify the root cause in our model is pretty fine. And we have, I think it's six of them. I don't know them by memory, but the first one is that the procedure is not available or inconvenient to obtain, or the procedure is difficult to use, or the use is not required, but should be required, or we don't have a procedure for the activity. That will fall into the procedure not used. So once I identify, let's say that I, I, I didn't use the procedure because uh, the procedure was inconvenient uh, to obtain, then I would have to see how is it that you access your procedures. Well, we have one workstation for 10 of us um, because we decided that we are going to have procedures in an electronic system to make it easier for quality to control the changes, but not easier for me to do the job. So, right. So then you're really limiting what your team can do because they're all waiting for one machine or that machine might not be near them in terms of their daily activities. And then it's exactly. right. So it's either too difficult or too complex. And I make mistakes or too simple that I'm making mistakes. You know, uh, a lot of people don't think that sometimes you have to complicate the process to avoid human error. You know, if we think of, a, of an example, you're in your computer and you press the, um, the, the, the you know, the command to, to erase your hard drive. Um, you want to have a couple of barriers of defense. Are you sure you want to? Are you really sure you want to do this? Now put a password. So it's kind of complicating things. So you really think about what you're doing. So it all depends on the activity. Sometimes I want to simplify it or sometimes I have to incorporate a distraction so you pay attention. So right. your level of attraction increases again. And so there's a lot of psychology here. And we Absolutely. don't have psychology. <laughs> and, and that makes sense when you're dealing with humans, right? Because there are so many variables. Not every person thinks the same way and not every person acts in the same manner. And every person responds differently to uh, their environment, to stimuli, and to activities. So it, it does take almost a psychologist really to start sort of yes. figure out it's how about explaining to... human behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, I, what I'm hearing from you then, in terms of steps that organizations can take, is to um, compare what you know their their current activity with best case scenario and figure out where they are. Um, and then um, has some sort of investigation program, which includes categorizing and classifying their, yeah. um, their metrics and, and the different things that are uh, the numbers data that's coming back to them, identify the near root cause, which is not the root cause, but maybe the catalyst for the root cause, right? And then ultimately identify the root cause so you can remediate based on findings. Does, does that sound like it in a yes. nutshell? <laughs> yes, and, and, and that's why in our model, we put together a, a, a tool, it's called a root cause determination tool that has um, all of this already um, established. So I have a tool that has 100% of the reasons why people make mistakes in organizational setting. So all you have to do is identify and in the process, it creates a code. For example, C4C06 means that it was a human error due to procedures being incomplete because if the situation is not covered. So once you have a code, now you can quantify and see, look, I have this many Cs, which means human performance. I have this many C4s, which means procedures. So now I start to start to see what are my major contributors, but I don't know it if I don't measure it, that even though it sounds like a cliche, it's true. If I don't know um, how many um, situations I have associated to procedures, then I won't be able to fix it. And, and one of the things that we've seen, and I use the procedures um, as an example because it's very easy to understand, but sometimes we see, okay, we, we got as far as to identify that it was related to procedures. Um, so now what we're going to do is that we're going to revise all the procedures, but we don't know what's wrong with the procedures. We do know that procedures were the, the contributing about it. What do I do? So I start with a black horse with white dots and I finish with a white horse with black dots, still a horse. So you didn't identify what was wrong with the procedure and all of a sudden everybody's running around revising the procedures just because there is a project and we have to revise the procedures, but I don't know what's wrong with them because I never went that far. 
So then, so obviously you don't know if your if your revisions then are going to solve for the original problem, right? So it takes a lot of investigation, and you have to keep digging and diving in deeper and deeper until you come up with the exact, like pinpoint exactly where the issue was. You know, in procedure A, section four, we failed to include, you know, steps X, Y, and Z, or whatever, right? You have to get that down to the nitty gritty in order to be able to A, fix, solve the problem and B, really respond correctly to any findings that the um, regulatory agency may have noted in their um, audit, Yeah. right? Are they Absolutely. expecting us to Let me give you an respond? example. Let me, let me give you an example. There was a spill, right, um, from a tank um, and we had to do an investigation. And of course, that's not normal. So I do want to make sure that that the tank was okay, that the valves had the preventive maintenance, that troubleshooting was done, um, and right. so on and so on. Once I identify that the equipment is not responsible for this, then I have to ask myself what happened. So I need to continue to investigate. Then we find that the reason uh, why this happens is because a valve was open in the wrong sequence. Okay, so who opens the valve? Okay, the operator. Now I understand that. So the operator opens the valve. So now I have to do an, uh, an interview and talk with the operator and see what happened. And this could be the response. Well, I was following the procedures. The procedures not used is not the near root cause. Um, was the procedure misleading or confusing? No, no, the procedure was, was not misleading. Um, it was clear, it's not confusing. Um, it says clearly says here, make sure valve 15 is in the open position. And that's what I, I did. So when we continue um, with the process and in the investigation, the, the operator tells us, yes, I was following the procedure. The procedure says, make sure valve 15 is in the open position. But when I got there, it was closed. What do I do? Do I open it? <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's what he did. And that was the, that was the, the, the reason for the spill because if the valve was, was closed, there was something wrong. There was a sequence that needed to be, um, to happen and when you say make sure it's a check step so right. if you have a check step you have to tell me what do i do if i find a different condition so i have to make sure but if it's not um if you know if it's not open which is what i'm supposed to check what do i do then it's going to be totally dependent on my analysis individual decision so in this case it was like well make sure that is open let's open it but that yeah, was not right. the expectation. Which was the wrong thing in this case, but that was the best information they had at the time, exactly. right? Exactly. You have, and, and there's personality. There's people that, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person, and again, my friends tell me that I'm my own experiment because I make all the mistakes. Some people think that once you are, you know, studying <laughs> this, you're going to be perfect. But I'm the kind of person that I will be like, let me see, it exploded. Oh, that was not it. But yes. there is other people that are going to, that it's, it's a little bit more, more conservative in terms of the, um, you know, the actions. Um, and, and we have a very interesting um, general, generational situation, okay? Baby boomers are very obedient. They follow their rules, even if the rules don't make sense to them. Then we have Generation X, which is me. We fight for everything. And then you have millennials, which are not going to follow instruction just because you tell me to do it. And, and, right. and that's one of the things that we are seeing some increase because I could have a procedure that tells me this is what, what you need to do. And I'm going to do it because I'm an obedient person. I follow the rules based on my personality, um, but others might not. And, and that's something to factor in and we don't want to depend on people that's precisely why the agencies tells you that you have to have robust systems right so in this case it's a people dependent system yeah absolutely because you you just can't i mean you can account for you know varying personalities to some extent um but you can't control their responses exactly. anyway. so yeah that that's uh very interesting. Very interesting. So, I mean, you need a psychologist and um, <laughs> definitely in your department and um, you definitely need to have an organizational psychologist, not right. a clinical one. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I think um, this has been a very enlightening conversation. I, I 
have learned a lot today. I hope our listeners have too. Um, I'll be, as we get ready to close, Jeanette, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about specific takeaways or any last thoughts you might have um, that you'd like to leave our listeners with today. Well, the first one is that um, we need to start looking at human error as something that could happen to us. We talk about human error like it's something different than us. We all make mistakes, so we need to um, you, you know, identify with what happened. Um, so, so now we, we will understand a little bit more the limitations. I know that I forget things. I know that sometimes my attention is not the best one. And we accept that in our lives all the time. But then when it comes to the organization where we should have all the control, we don't. And, and, and that's a good takeaway. We, it, you know, it's, it's not, um, you know, Human error is about explaining human behavior. So I can put barriers of defense or detection mechanisms because I cannot eliminate them all. You know, human right. error is going to exist. What I need to do is ma make sure that I'm keeping errors where I still can control the magnitude of the consequences. So, and it's way too critical. Then we need to do um, automation. Then we have to think about Um, records, manufacturing. We have to think about that. If we want zero errors, we have to eliminate the human from that activity. Right, right. And that's not, I mean, we are getting to a place where some things are becoming uh, much more automated in our, um, in our industry, but I, we will never get to a place where you can eliminate all humans. So um, that, those people, are important people away. say what you're saying is going to create a situation in which people are going to be phased out. And that's not the truth because then you will have some people that need to do the coding. So you will find errors there too. Not yeah. only that, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I keep thinking about with artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence is something that we have put in place um, to avoid human error to a degree. Um, now, is artificial intelligence the solution to human error or is human error the problem that artificial intelligence has? You know, like the chicken or the egg. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so you, and, and if you study a little bit, you see, well, I have um, self driving cars, but they, they are programmed for certain scenarios. And I cannot, right. I cannot predict all possible variables. The human Absolutely. could. The human could, but the equipment, no. You know, I the human has the, the capability of analyzing unlimited variables, but not the equipment. Right, right. And so we will continue to have humans, uh, you know, in <laughs> working in uh, the industry, and we will continue to have to take um, every step to reduce the errors that are a result. But um, this, I think, conversation today is a great first or second step mm -hmm. um, in an organization's journey to reduce and then ultimately eliminate as much human error as possible. So I thank you, Dr. Jeanette, for being our guest here today. It's been great to have thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It has been great. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we really appreciate your insight and expertise on this topic. So, um, so we'd love to have you again another time. Thank you. I'll be more than glad. Awesome. Also, I want to give a big shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen, sending out our appreciation also to you, our valued listeners. I'm grateful for your time each week and for your help in sharing this podcast. Because of you, we have grown a lot in this last year. So if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice and be sure to share it with your friends, colleagues, and online networks so they can enjoy it too. Please send us a quick note or leave an online review. We'd love to have your feedback. For show notes and additional podcast information, please visit www.ivtnetwork.com. We'll be back again next week with another innovative and insightful discussion. Until then, make it a great week.